Um, so like I said, I'm here to talk to you about the systematic genocide uh, that's found in forced adoption and relocation of Native American children. This is something that's particularly important to me because I'm very grateful to say that I've been raised to know my own culture. My father is Mohawk. Um, we're not very prevalent here at Wheaton, um, but there are a lot of Native resources in New England. I'm grateful to say that I've been able to you know, know a part of my culture, to know about Iroquois culture in general. And the fact that these children are raised without any access to that is absolutely devastating. So I'm going to start off with a brief history of forced adoption and relocation. It's not something that's new at all. Um, forced assimilation really was the start of forcing Native children into non-Native homes, even as far back as the start of praying towns in colonial New England. Um, most people who are familiar with Wheaton have probably heard of Natick, which is near Boston. And Natick, in fact, is one of these original praying towns. So these were towns where Natives were told that if they uh, sort of forgot, well, forgot their ways and became Christian, spoke only English, uh, didn't use any traditional uh, Native goods or any of that sort of thing, they lived as if they were white, although they weren't considered good enough to live within white society, they were told that they would be safe. They weren't safe. They were still attacked, burned down, killed. Um, but their children went to universities and colleges with white students when they could. And they were told that if they adapted this white lifestyle, um, if they dropped their culture, that they would be able to have a better chance. Once praying towns were uh, sort of outdated, there was a big history of adoption of orphaned children. So once armies, well, small battalions, would go into native areas and kill off villages, usually of women and children, people like this, um, they would take whatever orphans had survived. If anyone's ever heard of Sitting Bull's recount of Wounded Knee, where he says that he saw a dead uh, infant nursing at her mother, that child was actually adopted by some of the same people who killed her own family. Later on, there was a big history of residential schools. These are not as distant as a lot of people think. The last one closed in Canada in 1996. That's within most of our lifetimes. Residential schools were horrible, horrible places, and at first, parents thought that they were helping out their children. They thought that if they sent their children to these schools, they would learn white ways, and they could bring aspects of Native culture to the United States, and also aspects of white culture to Native communities. However, there's a horrible history of um, physical, sexual, and mental abuse that went on at these schools, and most of these children were taught to hate who they were and who they came from. In the 1950s and 1960s, there's the Indian Adoption Project, which was a government-sponsored project in which white families would adopt Native children. They were taken forcefully from their families, and the people who adopted them really did believe that they were helping them. They thought that if they cleaned them up, if they took away their Native savage image, that they would be able to live as whites and as people of education. It was inherently racist, um, but a similar thing was done to black babies as well, though it wasn't to the same sorts of numbers as Native American children. In response to all of this, the National Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978. This was a period of time in which uh, people of color in general, but especially Native Americans, were learning that they did in fact have a place in this country that could be respected if they asked for it and if they really spoke out against the ongoing crimes committed against their people. This was after, of course, the, big, uh, the largest parts of the American Indian movement, and it was the start of a pan-tribal uh, sort of union of people of all tribal nations. So throughout this, I'm going to be speaking on Native American communities. I'm going to say that a lot. And I want you all to recognize that there isn't actually an idealistic Native American community. We're a diverse group of people ranging from, um, if you count, Central America and other parts, ranging possibly from two continents, though in this I'm um, speaking mostly on the United States and Canada. Um, but there isn't a particular Native American community. Different tribes have different cultures. It's just that this is something that extends throughout tribes. The National Indian Child Welfare Act was intended to help keep Native American children within Native homes, uh, preferably within their own tribes. It's sort of shifted a bit now so that when properly funded, it can assist more modern issues, um, such as preventing the sort of things that DSS uses as grounds to remove children, but also to sort of uh, better fund Native-based foster care homes and Native-based homes in which children are placed. It also tries to um, fund Natives who don't have access to the proper legal means. So it helps offer uh, legal consultation and individual case support. 
So why is any of this an issue? A lot of people think it shouldn't matter what race someone is who's raising a child, right? 2014, we were racial equality. Um, but it's incredibly important. Since 1492, obviously assimilation has not only been implied, but forced. And it's only been within the past 30 years or so that natives have been allowed to live their own lives. Indigenous religions of any type were outlawed until 1979, which, I mean, it's kind of unreal. Um, and the fact that these children were among some of the first to be able to be raised the way that their parents want them to, to be able to be raised to be proud of who they are, the fact that these children now do not get this as they are removed from their homes is unacceptable. I'm going to shift here and uh, get a little more specific. I'm going to talk about ongoing forced adoption in South Dakota. This is still a huge issue. Um, over 700 children are adopted forcibly, taken from their homes, um, not counting those who are given up by their parents. Uh, per year. Native Americans only make up about 15% of the population of South Dakota, but over 50% of children placed in foster care in the state are Native American. Nine out of ten of these children, who are usually Lakota, go to white foster homes. This doesn't mean that there aren't Native homes available. There are plenty of well-funded, well, less funded, I suppose, but plenty of available homes who are happy to take in Native children who are run by Natives. Usually the children are removed on false claims, and when the parents expect police officers to come and do investigations for the reasons that the children were removed, there's never an ongoing, or there's never a, um, a follow-up or an investigation. Sometimes children are even taken from school without parental notification at all. So parents have been, uh, there are many people who have reported waiting for their children outside of the bus stop, and they just never come home. And when they call the school, the school says, well, your child's been taken, um, you know, there are grounds of, supposed drug abuse or supposed um, child abuse, which will never actually get followed up. This also means that the children never get to go home to say goodbye to their families for a final time. Reservation residents, and most of these people do live on reservations, um, they don't have the same access to uh, state-appointed lawyers, uh, the same sort of resources that those who live outside of reservations have. So when they actually use tribal courts, uh, it's often an inefficient or useless process that either is corrupt within the reservation or that isn't taken seriously by state or federal courts. The worst part of this is that adoption is a profit for the state of South Dakota. Any state is going to receive payment for placing children in foster care. That makes sense. You need to keep clothing on children's backs. You need to keep them fed. Um, but depending on the percentage of poverty, a state may receive more or less. South Dakota, which is a reasonably unpopulated state uh, compared to others, receives over $100 million per year because of poverty that is found within indigenous communities in the state. Some of the poorest places in the United States are found in South Dakota. Pine Ridge Reservation, Rosebud Reservation, He Dog Reservation, these are all very poor areas, some of the poorest in the entire country. People still freeze to death yearly, um, or regularly, sorry. But this also encourages the adoption incentive bonus, which is something given out um, by the state and by the government to the actual state's funding um, for every child. On average, it's about $4,000 per child. However, in order to increase profits in the early 2000s, South Dakota declared that any Native American child was special needs. Not only is that incredibly offensive, but it also means that they receive about $12,000 per child. If you're getting 700 children per year at $12,000 per child, it's a lot of money. Some foster homes will acquire more payment than others, and these homes are always statistically white-based. They take in Native American children, but they are run by white families. They do not accept the sort of cultural needs of Native American children, and they really just don't do a proper job. It wouldn't really be fair if I stood up here and just told you a sad story and didn't tell you to do anything about it. <laughs> um, so I will admit that I feel that drawing attention to this issue is extremely important. Most people who don't have connections to Natives don't know that this is happening. This is, uh, the Native American demographic is a group upon whom there's a lot of racism. Um, I mean, we have a team called the Redskins, but no one cares. And uh, we're a group who really doesn't get much of a voice in the United States unless you're in a Native American area. So I feel the first step is to draw attention to this. This also means that I would hope that everyone here, upon learning about this, uh, would be able to do some research on their own to see that this really is a horrible, horrible issue. Secondly, we need to support organizations run by Natives, such as the Lakota People's Law Project or the Lakota Initiative for Family Empowerment. These groups are the groups that are most affected by forced adoption. 
Um, these are also groups that help to prevent the whole white savior aspect of helping natives. They know their own problems. They have seen their relatives, their neighbors, their friends lose their children unfairly, and they are working to make a change in their community. In fact, as of today, um, three people from the Lakota People's Law Project went to Washington, D.C. and officially received um, payment as a group, as in funding, from the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's huge. I'm very excited that that happened today, since my talk is now. But um, it's very important. Finally, I know the petitions aren't exciting, they're anticlimactic, you might be thinking, why should I add my name to this list, it might not do anything. But in a situation like this, this is really one of the only ways to make a difference. Um, tonight I'll be posting this link onto the We Talks page and onto the Roosevelt Society page, and I'll also post it as a status if you're friends with me. Um, if you're not able to access any of these groups, you can just easily Google petition uh, for State American Adoption and you will find this. So I ask you to please think about this issue to sort of make it something that you might consider, whether it's just for a week, a day, or make it something that you really want to change. And I thank you so much for listening.